Speaker, this morning we begin speaking on the motion to condemn the horrific attacks carried out by Hamas. We spoke about the trauma triggered and the immense pain that so many Jewish community members are, fleeing, are feeling across the world. I shared my personal belief that is deeply rooted in the teaching of my faith that forbids and condemns the killings of innocent civilians. And with that belief, I want to reiterate my values as a Muslim and a human to condemn killings of all innocent lives. We must join together in condemning the attacks by Hamas and with that responsibility to human rights and justice, we must also look at the bigger conflict that has brought horror across Israel and Palestine. As an immigrant from a nation that was born out of a liberation war, and as a daughter and descendant of people who faced war crimes in their own country, a country that experienced the horrors of genocide, I come to you asking for a call for peace. Peace for the Israeli people. Peace for the Palestinian people. I want to quote an essay that scholar Peter, By Peter Beinart published in the New York Times here, because it really resonated with me, and I think it resonated with a lot of my colleagues and friends that I have spoken to over the last couple of days. Mr. Beinart is a prof professor of journalism and political science and an editor of the Jewish Currents magazine. And I quote, as Jewish Israelis bury their dead and recite psalms for their captured. Few want to hear at this moment that millions of Palestinians lack basic human rights. Neither do many Jews abroad. I understand. This attack has awakened the deepest traumas of our badly scarred people. But the truth remains. The denial of Palestinian freedom sits at the heart of this conflict which began long before Hamas's creation in the late 1980s." End quote. I felt Mr. Beinert's words were powerful. The violence did not start last weekend with Hamas's attack. The people of Palestine have endured brutality for decades, violence that has endangered the lives of civilians in Israel and Palestine. And we cannot deny the complex history that has impacted generations in this region and the deep trauma it has caused. Today we are seeing innocent Palestinians suffering at a scale we have never seen before as a result of the siege of Gaza. Two million Palestinians in Gaza, half of whom are children. These children must have the same rights, Speaker, as everyone else and should not and must not be treated any differently because of where they live who they are, or what their families believe. Within hours of Saturday's tragedy, shock, and horror, we saw what many feared, a massive bombardment on Gaza, killing thousands of innocent Palestinian civilians. A bombardment led by the current Israeli government, a hawkish government, one that has been called out by many of its own citizens in Israel as not reflective of their views the values, and the people it supposedly serve. A government whose defense minister called the people of Palestine human animals. These are innocent people who must not be punished for actions they, did, they are not responsible for, Speaker. And I want to reiterate, Palestinian people are not human animals. Palestinian people are not human animals. Palestinian people are not human animals. We are outraged by the terrorist attacks by Hamas, and we are appalled by what we are seeing from the siege of Gaza by the Israeli government. We are seeing children, women, and elderly people being attacked without discern. 2,808 Gazan have, Gazans have been killed so far including more than 1,030 children. More than 10,000 have been injured, and more than 1 million Gaza Palestinians displaced. Blockades and moves to stop or slow the flow of food, fuel, water, electricity, and medical supplies into Gaza, and the absence of a humanitarian corridor out of Gaza is causing, causing massive suffering and casualties. 
Canada must urgently insist that Israel respect international law and protect the lives of innocent Palestinian lives, civilians who bear no responsibility for Hamas's horrendous attack. Just yesterday, the Israeli government bombed the Rafah border between Gaza and Egypt, further preventing humanitarian aid from reaching those who desperately need it. Hospitals in Gaza are in the midst of a catastrophic shortage of medical supplies. And blockades are not only preventing humanitarian aid from reaching the region, but also further jeopardizing the very lives of innocent civilians. And to make matters worse, the state of Israel has also cut power in Gaza, leaving hospitals reliant on external generators that are running on borrowed time, as confirmed by the United Nations. This power crisis places thousands of patients in even more immediate danger, particularly those already on the brink of life and death including kidney and cancer patients. And according to the United Nations Population Fund, the situation is further exacerbated by the alarming fact that nearly 50,000 pregnant women in Gaza cannot access health care due to the damaged hospitals. This power outage is also threatening the lives of newborns in incubators. Just on the health care front, Speaker, 24 health facilities, including six hospitals, have been directly damaged by airstrikes. Tragically, 15 healthcare workers have, been, have lost their lives, while another 27, 27 have been injured. And on top of this, just, just, recent, just today, I believe, the Toronto Star reported a story of a direct airstrike on a hospital that killed 500 Palestinians and had thousands of others that were in that hospital. This just happened. And on top of all of this, the UN Relief Agency has reported that almost half a million people have been left without access to food. How can we, as a global community, stand idly by while healthcare facilities are not only targeted but decimated, leaving countless innocent lives in jeopardy? Lastly, access to clean drinking water, something we talk about in this House Speaker. Clean drinking water in Gaza is becoming increasingly scarce, with families spending hours just searching for water. Those who do find water often rely on private vendors operating small desalination, desalination and water purification plants, primarily using solar energy. Others are left with no choice but to drink blackish, brackish water from agricultural wells, sparking concerns about the potential outbreak of waterborne diseases such as cholera. From food, fuel, power, water, humanitarian aid has been blocked. The blockade, which has been ruthlessly imposed by the Israeli forces, has deprived Palestinian residents of freedom of movement and crippled Gaza's economy. These tactics by the Israeli government may very well amount to a war crime. In fact, they have all been well documented by Human Rights Watch, not us here, but the Human Rights Watch, the Amnesty International, and the Jewish organization Bate Salam as war crimes against Palestinians of all faiths. The United Nations Secretary General has said that we are on the verge of the abyss as he urged Israel to consider the humanitarian rights of Palestinians. So I ask this House, do innocent Palestinian civilians not have the same right to survive as everyone else in this world? I ask again, do innocent civi Palestinian civilians not have the same rights to survive as everyone else in this world. The United Nations, the UNRWA Commissioner General, Felipe Lazarni, says this, the siege in Gaza, the way it has been imposed is nothing, and this is what they called it, a collective punishment, demanding an immediate passage for essential supplies. When the UNRWA Commissioner General calls it a collective punishment, and you can just look up on Wikipedia what a collective punishment identifies as, and you co-signing on something that gives a free pass for any state, for anybody to go ahead and do whatever they want. Just, just think about what you're signing on to. Just think about what you're signing on to if you're giving a carte blanche to do what they want to do, and commit such crimes. Just, just think about it. And I, this morning I talked about members who have their own stories. 
There were parliaments that were sitting and there were debates in 1971 when the genocide happened in my nation, in my, where I was born. And there were genocide that took place in other places. The impact of this war has also been felt here in Canada. And I talked about that this morning as well. As we are seeing an alarming rise of anti-Semitism, Islamophobia, and anti-Palestinian hate. In a concerning incident last week, the Toronto police arrested three individuals and their hate crime unit is now actively investigating, investigating threats that were aimed at a Jewish high school in North York. It's a school we're talking about. Such acts of blatant anti-Semitism and hatred are deeply, deeply troubling. And it is essential that they are thoroughly investigated and addressed to ensure the safety and security of all community members. The Toronto police have also investigated two recent acts of vandalism at a local mosque. Both believed to be hate-driven, one of which occurred on October 12th at the mosque on, Toronto, on Danforth and Don Lenz Avenue, which has targeted with hate symbols and hateful, hateful writings. In the, in the United States, and I want to share this example because it was particularly horrifying. In the United States, we have also heard about the heartbreaking story of a six-year-old Palestinian-American boy being stabbed 27 times by their landlord simply for being Palestinian. His mother, Hanan Shaheen, was attacked and severely injured by a man because she said she would pray for peace as the conflict in Israel and Palestine raged on. In these times, the urgency for de-escalation and a ceasefire cannot be overstated. The loss, the loss of thousands of innocent lives, including women, children, the elderly, and their entire families, is unjustifiable. We must join the international community in calling for an immediate end to the violence. I join my Ontario NDP colleagues, and I think I can say this for everyone in this legislature, to call the federal government to do everything possible to reunite family members of Canadians who were horrified and impacted by these attacks. We cannot lose any more lives. A colleague of mine, a staff member of our caucus, my friend Farah, who has given me permission to share this, so I will share her story. Farah last week received a call with unimaginably devastating news, news that she had lost 18 members of her family in Khan Yunis, Gaza. And 10 members of her family are still under rubble. 18 members of her family, the Samur family, gone in minutes. Grandparents, children, moms and dads, gone. In, and 10 of them are still under rubbles. And speaker, her story is just one of many. It is with her family in mind and the families of everyone affected by this horrific crisis that we call for a ceasefire, a humanitarian aid corridor to save innocent lives. And we call for us to work towards a sustainable solution where Israelis and Palestinians can live in peace, security, and mutual self-determination. The solution can only be political. There is no possible military solution to this decade-long conflict. I'm calling on our federal government to do everything in its power to stand with the United Nations in calling for peace and justice and to ensure the protection of civilians and respect for international law. Canada must also support international justice efforts by the International Court of Justice and the International Criminal Court to investigate war crimes by all military actors in Israel and Palestine. All war crimes by all parties to this conflict must be persecuted. I stand with all people in Israel and Palestine who yearn for peace, freedom, and security. And I thank you, Speaker.